thank you to the organizers for inviting me to talk about this very interesting topic of how the virus evolved uh, from bats to humans. Uh, and this coronavirus uh, that I'll present today, the discussion is partly based on what we have done in my group, computationally, as well as what has been discussed previously. And Alina did a great job of giving us a very a nice, succinct, and uh, you know, balanced view of what's out there with respect to policy, with respect to initial findings. What I would do is discuss a little bit more data-driven inferences that Alina alluded to and some others that uh, are of interest to many of you. And so, so as you know, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is a single-stranded RNA virus. Is it a positive sense virus that contains a bunch of proteins and the one that you know a lot about is the spike protein, uh, which is shown here with an S. So this SARS-CoV-2, of course, uh, was first detected in 2019 uh, in the Wuhan area. And since then, it has been studied. But this belongs to a family of, of uh, coronaviruses, some of which we know a lot about. For example, MERS, it was a pandemic, almost a pandemic-causing virus that, we, that came to our attention nine years ago. And also before that, uh, another one 18 years ago, SARS-CoV. Now, by looking at this timeline, we could make some kind of an inference that maybe SARS-CoV-2 came from MERS because MERS was recently around, and then MERS may have come from SARS-CoV. So sometimes this kind of very simple linear thinking of timing is unfortunately not true. Uh, and we need to actually do uh, analysis of data from these coronaviruses, genetic analysis, to understand their history. So the timing of emergence is not sufficient. We need to really test it. And the reason I bring this up right now is that while many of you are aware of this, a number of times when we talk about the origin of SARS-CoV-2 in human population, it spread, we constantly go back to the first time we observed it. So the first time of observing any virus is not sufficient for us to know whether that was the ancestral or the starter of all outbreaks. And so what we need to do is uh, phylogeny or evolutionary tree analysis that uses only genetic differences. And that's agnostic to timing and location where those strains are found. And this has a great benefit of, uh, of then mapping this information onto the evolutionary history or the phylogeny and be able to say something about who the closest relatives are and how the virus originated. And this is the standard practice in microbiology and, uh, and uh, in study of pathogens. And so here is a tree that was uh, recently published by Benatol, uh, which builds an evolutionary tree of sequences of coronaviruses sampled from a large number of individuals as well as species. And this, in this tree, I have highlighted SARS-CoV-2, which, which began approximately two years ago with the red, a color scheme I will use throughout this presentation. And then the blue is actually SARS-CoV, which happened uh, to come to our attention 18 years ago. So as you can see, it is a 16 years gap between SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2, and both of them derived from a common ancestor with a high reliability, the scientists can place uh, on from a common ancestor. Uh, and then when, when we look for MERS, what we find is actually a much more distant virus that came around nine years ago. So the timing of sampling of coronavirus is not sufficient for us to know their genetic similarity or their ancestry. And this is why what I would do throughout this talk is talk about how these trees or phylogenies really inform us about many questions we have. And obviously, as Alina mentioned, and you will hear again, is that of course, these analyses cannot tell you all the answers but they can start to help you exclude possibilities. And so this is what I will do throughout this. And let's focus on SARS-CoV-2 now uh, as our uh, question of interest. And this is a tree of SARS-CoV-2 sequences. In bold are sequences from human samples. It just means various patients and their coronaviruses. And then you also see sequences from pangolin, bats, different pangolins and different bats. And here I would like to define a couple of terms uh, or names here, so it's easier to discuss. Uh, the literature is really full of a lot of information in which 
the nomenclature is quite confusing sometimes. So I refer to, and we should refer to the common ancestor of all the human infections in the case of SARS-CoV-2 as the proximate of progenitor. So this is the most recent common ancestor of all human SARS-CoV-2 infections, whether they were in Wuhan or elsewhere uh, throughout the world. And there have been more than a quarter billion such infections we know about with a large number of, uh, large amount of mortality. So this was, in a sense, the coronavirus that was present in patient zero. And this is the granddaddy of all coronaviruses that are infecting uh, and causing COVID-19. And this coronavirus really evolved from the ultimate progenitor. This is ultimate progenitor, which is the most recent common ancestor of this proximate or granddaddy progenitor and non-human coronavirus. So here you can see we have the ultimate progenitor and then we have the proximate progenitor and the questions that Alina and many of us are, are asking are about this transition from ultimate to proximate progenitor. And this is the real question uh, shown by the dotted line. What were the series of steps that occurred naturally or non-naturally? And what was the ultimate progenitor like? And what was the proximate progenitor like? This is the question we are all interested in. And by the way, we can define what ultimate progenitor is because we have a bad coronavirus, uh, in this case, uh, some sampled in China and Southeast Asia that provide a, a attachment point or a point that defines where the ultimate progenitor is. And as I'll discuss later, this ultimate progenitor could have existed 10, 20, 30, 40, 100 years ago. So, so now when we come down to this kind of a picture, which I will keep throughout the presentation, we have a lot of questions. What did this ultimate progenitor genome look like? Who was the animal host of this virus? And when and where was that? So these kinds of questions we could ask in a data-driven way by using sequences and of course, some information about where the sequences came from. And then we also have questions about proximate progenitor. What was the genome of the virus that infected patient zero? When was that and where was that? And then there are a large number of questions in between. What were all the events between ultimate to proximate progenitor that made that early coronavirus into what ultimately infected and spread in the human population. So we have what kind of adaptations happened, who, where, and when they happened, what species were involved, and was this non-natural evolution involved in this process? So these are fundamental questions that scientists and journalists, everyone is grappling with, and politicians. So who was the proximate progenitor? Let's ask that question. And what can we say? So because the earliest genomes available are from last week of December in China, we can e immediately start with a hypothesis that the Wuhan, Hubei uh, genomes sampled in 2019, uh, in the last week of December, they represent the proximate progenitor. They were the starting of all pandemic. This is ultimate question. And if this is true, and this is sort of how my group and many scientists work, is if it's true, then Wuhan, which I will call Wuhu uh, 2019 genome, one of them will be the proximate progenitor. And this is really what we expect to see. If that happens, then we can tell a very clear story. So we test the hypothesis, which is possible to do because a very large amount of data are available. Uh, when we analyze this uh, problem, we built an evolutionary tree of SARS-CoV-2 in humans, and we used 29,000 genomes, uh, which were very long ones, uh, from the early phase of the pandemic, the first uh, seven or eight months. And also we repeated the analysis later, and our study is the first one to be able to reconstruct the genome of pro uh, the proximate progenitor. And so on the left here is the complicated looking phylogeny. Uh, each, each branch here is basically a mutation. So as you can see, coronavirus has been mutating from the beginning. And in this case, we only use genetic differences. We did not use any information on when and where these coronaviruses were sampled. Uh, and 
In this case, it's pretty straightforward to, uh, to point out the proximal progenitor. It's right at the root of the tree. And now the question that we want to ask is, is Wuhan 2019, are those genomes, the mapping, any one of them map to the proximal progenitor? And what we find is, this is not true. In fact, Wuhan strains are mapping to further down the chain, let's say. And the finding is, is that Wuhan 2019 is not the ultimate, uh, sorry, in this case, I should say proximate progenitor of all the coronaviruses that have infected humans. And therefore, one thing we can say for sure is the Wuhan outbreak was the first major outbreak detected. But beyond that, clearly the unbiased molecular phylogenetics, not biased by timing or location, says they are not the same. So this makes life complicated. Now at least we can say that the Wuhan strains were preceded by other strains that existed prior to that, uh, to the first outbreak. And as Alina mentioned, there's a consensus in the field that that was indeed the case. Uh, so in fact, if we go and uh, really focus onto this one specifically, uh, what you find is that the proximate progenitor is three mutations earlier. In fact, uh, Jesse Bloom's study confirmed our findings that there are three mutations separating Wuhan 2019 and proximate progenitor. And you can see those steps in green and red. So this is three mutations earlier. And that allows us to know when this proximate progenitor might have existed. So three mutations in the kind of a clock of change in coronavirus would take six to eight weeks to occur. So this would say that if you walk backwards from December 24th, 2019, where the first Wuhan strains are available from, the proximate progenitor had evolved by late October, early November. And interestingly, our findings, which were published, uh, which were online in BioArchive for more than a year early on, they were they're confirmed by Jesse Bloom's work, uh, Packer's work, and also by, from retrospective sequencing in Amandola uh, et al.'s work. So essentially, there is a general consensus that the, the proximate progenitor was multiple mutations prior to the Wuhan strains that we discovered, uh, that were discovered. So now the question is, can we, how do we explain the absence of finding the proximate progenitor in Wuhan? Because if we had found it there right in the beginning, we would have seen it on the tree as a map. So if COVID-19 began and we don't, we are not certain if this is the case uh, in Wuhan, Hubei, or even China, then why don't we see the proximate progenitor there? What's the story? Why do we see something much later, like great grandchild of the proximate pro uh, progenitor? So one explanation is lack of data that you just heard about, and you'll see that everywhere in the news. And this lack of data is very clear when I show you this picture uh, of data that we had from early part of the pandemic. For example, the first three weeks, Z week zero, uh, week first, second, and third, you basically have very limited information. And red color here indicates, uh, you know, the A Southeast Asia, China, all these countries. And the number of genomes available is a handful in, during this time. So what is, so it's gonna be very difficult to can imagine, naturally we can imagine that it's hard to sample every genome. So yesterday I sat down and did a, a back of hand calculation on what is the probability that we will see the proximate and progenitor in Wuhan or China somewhere if it had actually existed there. Uh, and I actually came up with a number that we'll publish in the, in the near future, that there's a less than 25% chance of finding the progenitor given the current sample of only a few, uh, uh, only a few genomes. So, so this will indicate... Sudhir, Sudhir, sorry yes. to interrupt you. Maybe you should be a bit quicker if you want to be on time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So then, oh, what about, did we find it immediately after we get lots of data? As you can see in week number four, four weeks after uh, December 24th, we find that there are much more data. So did we find the progenitor there? And in fact, it's true. Uh, once the probability of finding the progenitor becomes 100%, you actually find it. And you find it not just in China, but also in the US after mid-January. So, so it seems like 
this is true that progenitor existed most likely uh, in, it seems throughout the world even already. And in a 2 million genomes data set recently, we found that it's present at least 10 times in every month until June 2020 in many countries. So this gives you an idea of how there is data driven inference that the progenitor or the common ancestor of all the human SARS-CoV-2 has been around for a long time or persisted for many, many months. And actually, uh, I would say October 2019 to June 2020 is the minimum time span when the proximate progenitor existed. As the next, uh, next set of questions will be about viral genome, their animal host, and the virus, and when and where. So let's look at some of those possibilities. And here, we have a phylogeny again. Again, phylogeny helps us there. We have a phylogeny where you have SARS-CoV-2 uh, causing COVID-19, uh, clustered with all these different animals in which other coronaviruses have been sampled. And what you find is that all the, that this particular coronavirus is nested deep within the phylogeny or tree with all sorts of bats. And this makes us very clear, at least in molecular evolutionary biology, this will make us uh, arrive at the conclusion that bats likely contained the ultimate progenitor. They were the host of ultimate progenitor or reservoir. And as you can see here, the bat is in fuzzy pixels uh, near the ultimate progenitor is because there has been evolution since the ultimate progenitor existed many years ago, making the bat coronavirus that we sample today different. In fact, if these, the length of that branch was very, very short, we would be more certain that it was a bat coronavirus. Uh, ultimate progenitor was in the bat reservoir, but that is not the case. So what we could say is bats likely carried the ultimate progenitor virus, uh, this is one inference we can make from evolutionary analysis. And whereabouts of the ultimate progenitor is a standard practice in evolutionary biology to look at the closest relatives and where they existed. So the closest relatives of the human coronavirus are uh, the viruses with the name RATG13 and RMY02. And, and they are both uh, uh, sampled in Yunnan in China. So what could uh, and also, one can also date when that was the case. So if you look down here in this phylogeny, we are able to date this particular split between the bat and the human SARS-CoV-2 to be 40 to 50 years ago. So based on the published studies by a number of authors, we could say that bats in Yunnan may have actually hosted the ultimate progenitors. Uh, and this may be 40 years ago. And any kind of it can be anywhere from 60 to 20 years ago, uh, but uh, to 30 years ago, I should say. So basically by doing a phylogenetic analysis, we were able to see that bats were likely host, potentially China, Southeast Asia was the place where they were hosting as a reservoir. And the timeline of that divergence is uh, 1970 likely. So next question would be about intermediate events and, and species. So here I'll summarize some of the things that I have read and some of the analyses that we have seen. So there have been a debate about natural, non-natural using genetic data. There can be a lot of uh, other societal and laboratory reasons, but when you look at the genetic data, there have been primarily five biomarkers that have been discussed. And I'll talk about them each one uh, in sequence. So the first one is the furin cleavage site. Uh, the furin cleavage site is important for uh, enhanced infection and transmissibility of this coronavirus. And it's present in proximate progenitor and therefore it was acquired on the way from ultimate progenitor to proximate progenitor because neither of the relatives of ultimate progenitor actually contain FCS. So could the FCS insertion be non-natural or unusual? And that is the question we need to ask. When it comes to these kinds of a question, we can again look at the phylogeny. And here is the phylogeny in which I have marked absence and presence of FCS. And clearly it is found in, uh, in uh, human coronaviruses today. So non-natural hypothesis will actually receive support if FCS has never evolved previously or is very rare uh, to evolve. But what you find is uh, that FCS is, has already previously evolved in MERS and also other 
coronaviruses, including those that, that cause cold. Natural evolution of FCS is not rare. And when it's not rare, it's very difficult to, to then uh, attribute that to be a non-natural source. It does not, of course, exclude non-natural source, but one cannot just make that conclusion uh, very easily. Then, so the, the, here the take home message is FCS could have risen naturally. Then the other one is, oh, there are some rare codons or, or genetic uh, markers in the FCS itself, and it could be non-natural. Of course, in the, in the subsequent studies, it was shown that CGGs are not so rare in terms of commonality uh, in coronaviruses. Uh, and so this is not unexpected. Also, the, there, is, there has been a discussion that CGG may in fact, usage is likely natural and may not be caused by an engineered insertion uh, if, because if they were artificially inserted but otherwise suboptimal, then they may have been lost, uh, lost during the SARS-CoV-2 spread. It is a weak argument, but still gives you an idea that this is important for the virus. And it appears to be, if it was non-natural, it may have been lost, which is what happens in regular evolutionary biology. So CGG usage itself could be natural. Then, as for any kind of directional selection, diversifying selection, which is standardly done in molecular evolution and, and bio, evolutionary biology, we don't actually see any real signs of, of evolution in which there is more adaptive change on the way to SARS-CoV-2, as there are no highlighted branches that go to SARS-CoV-2 in these trees that you see. But this is uh, overly complicated for this current forum. But there has been general idea that evolution is mostly neutral in this case. Uh, there's another biomarker that has sometimes been discussed that there has been a loss of CPGs, which are Cs followed by Gs in genome, which can help to escape antiviral activities. But this uh, particular conjecture has been uh, shown to be not the case, because if you look down uh, at the red lines, you can see that many relatives of SARS coronavirus, and in fact, distant relatives of SARS coronavirus, all have low CPG. So the loss of CPG did not really or low CPG content did not arise on the way from ultimate to proximate, uh, but rather it is a property of this group of viruses that sometime are thought to have arisen uh, in uh, you know, five to 600 years ago. So this is not really a solid marker. And, uh, and this is one of the reasons why it is thought that the ultimate progenitor was already uh, a virus that could infect many species, which is what we see even today, that SARS-CoV-2 can infect many mammals. And this means that this CPG biomarker may not help us find the intermediate host, because there was no real need for an intermediate host to reduce the CPG content. Then another one that we hear about a lot is the RBD, or receptor binding domain of the spike protein. And in fact, this is a section in spike protein that is very important for uh, transmissibility and infection. And, and humans uh, spike protein area in this region is very similar to pangolin, one of the pangolin samples, rather than uh, the presumed host bats coronavirus. And so hypothesis is that maybe pangolins are intermediate species. The alternative is of course, there may have been genetic exchange so if there was genetic exchange, uh, if it's an intermediate species, then we expect pangolin to really be close to human in the whole spike protein. But that is not the case. If you look at all the other sections of the spike protein, uh, it is the bat coronavirus that, that shows the highest similarity and evolutionary relationship with human coronavirus. So, so this would make one conclude that the RBD similarity is likely due to recombination with the pangolin CoV, and it could have happened a few years ago or many, many years ago. So, so then ultimately the question is, who was the intermediate host? And uh, Alina discussed about that a few minutes ago. This is a question we have to ask. And so this is not a really a new question. If you look at the SARS-CoV-1, it has almost the mirror question 
and mirror image, uh, where it took a few years before they were able to find civets as the uh, as a species, stepping stone species here, uh, which we call intermediate host. And this was done after many, many sequences were obtained from many different animals. And so to me, it seems like we need more coronavirus genomes from humans and other species. And this, uh, this would mean lots of farms in China and elsewhere actually, and lots of different uh, banked samples from humans. It will give us an idea of what was the real diversity in humans and who could have been the host species if there was one. Uh, there is, uh, at this point, we do not know if the intermediate species actually was needed. Uh, and so, Sudhir, if you can conclude soon, uh, sure. a few minutes. Yes, just one more minute. And then I should say is that as we get more data from local humans, that means humans, uh, populations that were near the start of the pandemic, other mammals in those regions and other regions, and of course, maybe more pangolins than other species, we'll be, we will generally see a landscape of many recombination events uh, and uh, leading from ultimate to proximate progenitor. So while we can reconstruct the proximate progenitor sequence, ultimate progenitor sequence will be harder to reconstruct because of these recombination events, but we will have a better idea how it started uh, 40 years ago, maybe at that time, and how it moved forward. So just to conclude, genomic evolutionary trees and inferences, uh, when it comes to data-driven research, they are key to illuminating SARS-CoV-2 origins, asking a quest bunch of questions and answering some of them. Uh, of course, I hope I haven't left you with more questions than answers, but that is normally in science where you answer one question and you get many others. But generally, uh, what you've seen is the bats are the likely hosts. Who could have come from China or Southeast Asia 40 to 50 years ago, uh, which gave rise to a proximate progenitor that infects us today, which could have been in Wuhan, Hubei, China. And on the way from ultimate to proximate progenitor, a number of innovations or changes happened in this coronavirus that uh, at this point, could be explained by natural evolution. Uh, and natural evolution could be carried out in any setting. Uh, sometimes, as Alina mentioned, natural evolution in the laboratory is hard to distinguish from natural evolution in nature. Uh, but generally, what we have observed about these five major biomarkers is they are similar to what happens in nature. So this is not unusual. So I want to thank my collaborators who are very insightful in uh, putting together this presentation and to the uh, to all the speakers and the uh, organizers thank you